The Lord be with you. God calls us to worship on this Ascension Sunday, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are together for worship, even as we are physically separate in our own homes. We'll follow the order of worship, which you can find on the Calvin Church website, calvincrc.org. As our God calls us to worship, God also greets us. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's sing our praise together. We will sing the hymn, Jesus Shall Reign, verses 1, 3, 4, and 5. Trusting in God's mercy and power to forgive, let us confess our sin. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have raised Jesus from death to life and crowned him Lord of all. We confess that we have not bowed before him or acknowledged his rule in our lives. We have gone along with the ways of the world and failed to give him glory. Forgive us and raise us from sin that we may be your faithful people, obeying the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ, who rules the world and is head of the church, his body. Amen. Dear friends, hear the good news of the gospel. God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. In Christ, by God's grace, we are saved. 
praise God from whom all blessings flow. As God's forgiven people, we are bold to come before God with our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. Let us pray. Mighty God, by your power you raised Jesus Christ to rule over us. On this Ascension Sunday, we praise you that he puts down tyrannies that threaten to destroy us and unmasks powers that claim our allegiance. We thank you that he alone commands our lives and gives us freedom to love the world. Glory to you for the gift of his life. Glory to you for his saving death. Glory to you for Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns as our risen Lord, now and forever. O Lord, as we seek your help to acknowledge your reign over all the world, we ask that your kingdom would come in every place. We lift up to you those affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, which is every one of us in some way. We lift up to you especially those who are sick, those who are medical caregivers, those who work in service industries and put themselves at risk for the sake of others, those who are lonely or unemployed or discouraged. Lord, in our church and community, we pray for those who are sick or recovering or in some way in need of healing. Care for Jan Wilkins, Sharon Hecker, Kim Stapert, Natalie Portinga, Marion Hirama, John and Ann Shooks, and all those who are on our hearts and minds. Care for the people of Midland, Michigan, after the flooding that occurred this past week. Guide and strengthen those who work to provide relief and safety for our neighbors in that city. Heavenly Father, care for students who are finishing their school year or who have finished or are about to finish. This is not the ending they expected or hoped for, and we ask that you would guide them through this time. Give to us as a church the calling to care for our youngest members with passion and with dedication. Bless each generation through the others in this group of people who are brothers and sisters because of the love of Jesus. Jesus Christ, head of the church, we thank you for providing for your church through each, each member who gives of their time and talents and treasures. Give our leaders on council what they need to lead your church and give us as a congregation the guidance of your Holy Spirit as we seek to follow you. We thank you for our partnership with the church around the world through missionaries, and we ask that by your Holy Spirit you would empower each of us in the work of mission in our own neighborhoods and workplaces. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would allow us to know you more and more as our Lord and Savior risen, ascended, and always present with us through the power of the Holy Spirit. We close together in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Let's sing together, Rejoice, the Lord is King, verses one, two, and four. Before we hear the word that God has for us today, let's pray together. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of all creation. You have taught us by your word. Open our hearts to your Holy Spirit and lead us on the paths of Christ, your Son. All praise and glory be yours forever. Amen. Today we read from Acts 1, and in the order of worship, it says Acts 1, 1 through 11, but since we published that, I've extended it, and I'm going to read from Acts 1, 1 through 14, Um, the reason why will come out later. So Acts 1, 1 through 14. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, Why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How appropriate is this quote from Will Willimon's commentary on Acts 1 for what we are going through right now? When the world falls apart, things come loose and chaos threatens, it is good to know who is in charge, who rules. These 14 verses at the beginning of Acts bring us immense hope today, no matter the mess they might find us in. And they bring us immense hope because they narrate something Christians have declared for centuries, Jesus is Lord. Let's establish that from the start. Jesus is Lord, and that means nothing and no one else is Lord. Not fear or anxiety, not death or disease, not evil, not violence, not insecurity, not even our own sin. Jesus is Lord. Today is Ascension Sunday, the point in the church calendar that marks 40 days after Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And this year, Thursday, May 21, was the actual 40th day after Easter. So on Thursday, you might have heard or seen some people talk about Ascension Day. But in the worshiping life of the church, we often celebrate the Ascension on the Sunday following Ascension Day. And while it may not carry the clout of Easter or Christmas, Ascension Sunday is is so important because it's Jesus' ascension into heaven to sit at the right hand of God that establishes Jesus as the Christ, the anointed one, the king of the universe, the king of all creation. It's the ascension that allows us to say Jesus is is Lord. And yet the ascension must have seemed quite strange to the first disciples and not a little bit frightening. I mean, they have been brought through the emotional gauntlet as followers of Jesus in the last 40 days or so. First, the devastation and the despair of Jesus' arrest, trial, and crucifixion. Then the confusion turned incredible joy of his resurrection from the dead. And now when when Jesus is finally with them for good, they think, he leaves. Or so it seems. And you can hear in the text that before Jesus ascends, the disciples expect that the resurrected Jesus will will now begin his political revolution. He's back from the dead. He's ready to start this political revolution. Uh, Listen again to Acts 1 verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Now that Jesus has resurrection power, the disciples anticipate vindication and maybe even revenge. We have Jesus back. We'll show those Romans. Behind the question they ask Jesus, there also seems to be this hope that Jesus will, you know, give them some of his death-defying power so that they can come alongside him as he restores the kingdom to Israel. Jesus, of course, knows what they're hinting at, and he replies with a soft rebuke, but also with a promise. It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So while the disciples expect a political revolution in Jerusalem, in Israel, 
God and Jesus has something grander in mind, a cosmos-wide redemption and restoration. A movement that begins with these disciples gathered here, but then spreads to the ends of the earth. Therefore, the, the, the death-defeating power that Jesus promises the disciples is not the death-wielding power of the sword, but instead the power to be witnesses. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, Jesus says, and you will be my witnesses. Here's the thing. If it is the ascension that allows us to say Jesus is Lord, then Jesus reveals himself in Acts 1 to be the kind of Lord who works continually to bring the universe, the world, back to himself. He's all-powerful, but he's not interested in conquering. He's the ruler over everything, but he doesn't rule with an iron fist. He is Lord of all creation, and he intends to bring all creation back to himself. And incredibly, the ascension story in Acts 1 shows us that Jesus has called his followers to be his agents in his mission. This is an essential part of what it means to be a Christian, to witness to the ascended Lord again and again. We are called to be witnesses to the ascended Lord so that the good news of Jesus might saturate the world. That does not mean that the mission is up to us. We have to remember always that Jesus is Lord. We are not Lord. But this does definitely give us purpose and identity, witnesses to the risen Jesus, to the ascended Jesus. And I've, I've thought a lot about this purpose and identity during the weird standstill of our lives in this pandemic right now. I've heard first and secondhand reports of people feeling like their lives are slipping away, like without work or without their regular routine or pattern, they've, they've somehow lost all purpose or all identity. And part of that feeling, I think, comes from the fact that we have been significant, significantly unmoored from our futures and unmoored from our routines. For all the uncertainties that plague us normally, we're not used to the pervasive nature of this current uncertainty and the degree to which that uncertainty prevents us from planning anything, anything about our lives in a month, in a week, even sometimes in a day from now. And our response to this uncertainty is often to reach for control or at least to reach for a narrative that might give us some certainty, might give us something to hold on to, something that might give us identity and purpose. I think this is why we're seeing such a spike in conspiracy theories right now and a spike in, in people gravitating toward these conspiracy theories. The unknown, the uncertain, is scary. So when someone comes along with an explanation for everything, it's easy to hop on the bandwagon. Okay, now there's some certainty again. Now there's some purpose. But as Christians, we have certainty and we have purpose right here in Acts 1. The certainty, the ascended Jesus is Lord. And the purpose to be witnesses to this Jesus. Of course, we're human, and so the certainty of Jesus' lordship doesn't always feel so certain. And witnessing to Jesus with our lives can seem impossible at times, given our sinful tendencies. And yet, like the disciples, we have the promise 
of verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now let's change gears slightly and and focus for a minute on Acts 1 verse 4. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. To wait there for the promise of the Father. The promise of the Father, of course, is the Holy Spirit, but it's also this promise that the disciples will receive power to be witnesses. So interestingly, part of the disciples' call to be witnesses to Jesus is to wait, to wait for the promise of the Father. And this is why I extended the reading into verse 14 of Acts 1, because verse 14 tells us that all these, all the disciples, were constantly devoting themselves to prayer. After Jesus ascends into heaven, we find the disciples waiting. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. To begin their time as Jesus' witnesses, the disciples pray and wait for the Spirit's movement. I'm personally grateful to hear this verse right now because I've wondered what it means to be a witness to the ascended Lord Jesus while we're mostly staying at home. And it seems that one major dimension of Christian witness is waiting. Waiting on the Holy Spirit to move. Waiting to see where the Holy Spirit leads. Waiting to hear from God, both individually and collectively. In two contrasting scenes from Acts 1, the, the, disciple, the disciples show us both what this waiting as witness does and does not mean or should and should not look like. And we'll start with the negative, what this waiting as witness shouldn't look like. Acts 1, 10 through 11 clearly shows us that waiting does not mean idly gazing at the heavens, wistfully longing to, for Jesus to come back. After Jesus ascends into heaven, the disciples are, ca- are caught open-mouthed and staring straight up into the sky. And two angels show up and say to them, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. It's almost as if the angel, angels are saying to the disciples, Friends, there is way too much hope in Jesus. You can't just stand there. And to their credit, the disciples get the message. And Acts 1 verse 14 shows us what waiting as witness does mean or does look like. To wait as part of our witness to Jesus means to constantly devote ourselves to prayer. To pray for the Spirit's leading and guidance to pray for grace each day as as we try and point to Jesus with our lives, to pray for forgiveness when we point to ourselves instead of Jesus. Waiting as witness means constantly devoting ourselves to prayer. To finish, let's return to that quote from Will Willimon. When the world falls apart, things come loose, and chaos threatens, it is good to know who is in charge, who rules. Friends, that's the good news today. The ascended Jesus Christ is Lord. And the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus, has a promise for us. 
You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we pray now that your Holy Spirit would guide us and lead us so that we might be your witnesses. Lord Jesus, use our lives as a stage on which to play out your redemption and remind us always that you and only you are king of the universe. Amen. People of God, as you go into the rest of this day and into this week, receive a blessing from our God. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with every one of you now and always. Amen.